All right, next up we have Zephyr giving a talk on symbolic computing. Moving on, uh, moving on up, please give him a warm TorCon welcome. Thank you, guys. Um, gosh, how are you guys doing for TorCon 20? It's been so long. I, I actually remember um, when I was in high school, I think this was TorCon 7, um, Weave gave a talk about Tor hidden, uh, unknown, it's unknown what he gave a talk about. He mentioned he was really high on LSD about halfway through, and uh, it, it, it was a talk, it, it really went from topic to topic, there was accusations, there was uh, some technical talk of Tor, um, and he had a, a hype man in the back that was just like a like hat backwards, full on, favor fave, like, yeah, yeah. It was really great. It was a great talk, but I, I wondered, you know, as he got into his description of how he had come to give this talk and why this talk was, was important, which didn't make any sense at all, I, I wondered, like, what kind of conference would possibly host such a, an event? And so when I had my own stream of consciousness based presentation, I knew who to take it to. Um, <clears throat> anyway, this is about symbolic execution, which I have been, I have been dealing with now for, oh, I would say the past three years. Um, I'm sure many of you here have heard of symbolic execution, um, maybe even part of like you know a more broad, temperamentally aligned dynamic taint analysis, um, or maybe like particular pieces of tooling, like when the Cyber Grand Challenge happened. Uh, a tool called Anger came out of that, and that's been, been of considerable interest. Um, and just going over, you know, what symbolic execution is, uh, you know, rather than some vague description of it, it's really quite simple. You provide symbols rather than concrete input as arguments to functions. And there's a variety of ways that you can manipulate these symbols. Um, a very, very common, uh, if antiquated, method is to supply some kind of uh, transformation, some description of what a transformation entails on each symbolic variable. And then as you go through the program, just as if you were running in an emulator, you make a note of that. Again, very similar to dynamic chain analysis. Uh, once you're at the end of that, the end of that being some arbitrary slice of the time that it took for uh, a program to get from either you know one basic block to another or from you know some wall clock time to another, you can uh, create the set of transformations that happen to that variable and then run that through something like a SAT solver, an SMT solver, some general purpose solver for determining what input yields what output, which if you're writing computer exploits, um, you know, that's critical, like that's a, that's a huge feature. If you can determine what do I need to provide to this function as input in order to get it to be in this state, uh, if that state is even possible to be in. And even more broadly, like there are tools that exist that can make, um, that can produce a general memory model of a computer program. And that memory model is, um, subject to all kinds of interesting restrictions about what kinds of things it can handle, but in general, it allows you to work with the, the most basic case of, here's a sized allocation, I have somehow or another gotten the ability to write out of the boundaries of this sized allocation, and that's a bug. Tell me about any condition that that can happen in, either in tandem with a fuzzer or through you know, some, some mechanism like I was discussing earlier. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about the history. I, I originally intended this talk to be you know, a full, complete understanding of how symbolic execution works and what it, what it entails, uh, and that was a little bit optimistic. Um, this, this is just a, the, the original, um, is a paper called Select, and Select uh, just in a sentence or two told you everything that I just spent the past five or 10 minutes doing. Um, symbolic execution proceeds as a normal execution, except the values may be symbolic formulas over the input symbols, just like solving for x with you know, your algebra problem from 
from middle school, high school, whatever, um, you can solve for x with a little bit more complex rules um, just instead of the, the rules of equality and transitivity and all that, you, you have the, the rules of x86 or you know, of C standard, whatever, whatever is appropriate. All right, um, select a, a fantastic computer program, really groundbreaking. Um, a paper called Effigy came about, which for reasons that are some combination of politics and chance, takes off. Um, and this methodology of symbolic execution remains influential in uh, program verification for years. But it, it takes a few more until computers are fast enough and the state of research is um, at the point where it is being applied by non-academics to the question of can we find exploitable vulnerabilities in computer programs using symbolic execution. And there's been a lot of doubts about whether this is a feasible path forward. I mean, uh, I know that Elkim Tuff, who's the author of AFL, uh, as well as POF, if you've ever used that, uh, you know, he, he, he basically grounded down and said this will never be used to find any non-trivial number of vulnerabilities in real computer systems. And I think I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to tell you that I actually show off a few vulnerabilities, including one zero day. Um, so get out your cameras. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it, it is indeed difficult, and it's a much different procedure than fuzzing. But I think that at the end of this talk, you, you'll have the power to um, work with a lot of these tools like CNBC, CLE, whatever the case may be, and find and exploit a very basic stack or heap overflow. Um, before we get into that, you know, why should you use a uh, you know, tool that employs symbolic analysis or, or more abstractly, abstract uh, analysis of computer programs? Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's tough to, to say. I mean, you always will have manual analysis given sufficient focus will be superior to any other form of analysis that uh, I can foresee in the near future, but um, a tool like CLE is going to be able to give you very fine-grained analysis of what conditions can be systematically pro or can be problematic and what can be detected and what, what, what kinds of conditions can be detected that result in whatever, memory corruption or, or who knows. Memory leaks, however. Um, it's really slow, though. Uh, I, I can tell you that uh, even tracing through uh, some of the variables that I had in Erlang, the Erlang runtime system is one of the vulnerabilities I'm going to discuss finding here. Um, you know, obviously, Erlang is an interpreted computer programming language. It's, um, you know, there's bytecode instructions, and then it calls out to C programs, and tracing the value of a variable through early, I mean, it, it took overnight before I was able to see this relatively modest set of transformations that were applied to a particular variable within the Beam virtual machine. Um, I got, I, I told you guys a little bit about what got me interested in this. Um, again, like, lots of people on IRC will tell you that it's useless, and and they don't usually have very good reasons for why it's useless. I don't have a background in, in SAT solvers or symbolic execution or, or anything like that. I, I, I come from the world of finding vulnerabilities, memory corruption bugs, and you know, corresponding exploits in those bugs. Um, what is this new symbolic execution thing? How can it benefit me? Uh, I did a ton of work to try to build myself up to the point where I could you know, have a firm grasp of what is entailed in symbolic execution. I actually wrote my own SAT solver. Uh, I watched on video lectures. I even wrote my own, like, uh, what you might call a lifter, which is like a basic, uh, highly idealized description of the behavior of x86 instructions, which is really, really quite, quite challenging. Like, there are hundreds of x86 instructions, and once you think you know, like, how complex x86 is, like, you don't yet know how complex, like, no matter how complex you've said it to be, it is yet more complex than that. And once you, you think you're at the limit, then you haven't yet considered, like, rep or shift left or all these other instructions that are just 
<clears throat> bizarrely, extremely complex. Um, and so by watching this talk, you can all avoid the hassle of doing this. And you won't ever need to write a, a <laughs> description of the transformations that particular x86 instructions entail um, so that when you write your ptrace based what a, a description of the state, uh, changing of the state of a register, you can just say, no, that's, that's useless. Um, oh, I thought I had another slide here. Never mind. Uh, so the very first vulnerability I found with this method, and I think I'm going to go a little bit into how I, I found this, but just as a description of what it is, uh, I said that here it's, this is a CMYK color space bug, but this actually was a bug in the decoding of the Huffman tables. This was in the Plan 9 JPEG um, library. And Plan 9, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, it's a research operating system produced by Bell Labs. A lot of people that worked on it later became really well-known. Uh, Rob Pike is intimately tied with Golang and Ken Thompson, who, you know, Unix, all, all that kind of stuff. So w what I mean to say when I, when I bring up all of these rather famous people is that it's a, generally a very high-quality code base. And um, despite a few nebulous conditions, I think if you were to manually review Plan 9, it would not be easy. And furthermore, uh, if you wanted to write a fuzzer, <clears throat> I mean, you can't really use AFL. Um, you're, you're working in a, in a system where you either need to use a, a port of the Plan 9 utilities to a POSIX system, or you <laughs> port AFL to some 90s research operating system. Uh, so what I did was, um, just as I as I described before, uh, I did this, did this manually. And that means breaking out an SMT solver and hunkering over the Intel manual. And you basically try to write something that describes what is the behavior of each x86 instruction. And, and you don't need to do every instruction, of course. There's huge, huge swaths of the set of x86 instructions that are not going to be used, and furthermore, you know, the Plan 9 x86 compiler doesn't even recognize, and so it can never emit as the, as the consequence of generating object code. Uh, you do need to do everything that's within, you know, the program, and that's still, again, hundreds of instructions. And so this is actually, I mean, uh, it's kind of ambiguous when I'm describing it to you here now, but what you're ultimately doing here is starting with the state of a computer program. The state meaning not even necessarily the memory, but what are the registers at this particular point? And given some highly idealized description of memory, which you can do in an SMT solver, um, give me the give me the set of things, the set of inputs that will cause this particular register to yield this particular output after these transformations have been applied to it. And so if you're doing a loop or something like that, you know, you just apply every one of those transformations and this big, big list of transformations to every one of the registers. And that's a very, very narrow case of what symbolic execution can do. That's that's like, um, you know, I, that basically required me to have some high-level insight about um, Jesus, uh, about the nature of what a computer vulnerability is and how computer vulnerabilities can be exploited. So then I'm kind of, you know, just doing the mechanics of how do I get from what I suspect is a vulnerability to what is certainly exploitable using, you know, a, a SAT solver. And that I would not recommend doing, but I do mention it because it is possible to do. And if you have any friends that run Plan 9, you can go check this function out. I, I have on my GitHub uh, an image that, that generates, um, that, that's a proof of concept for this, and, and you, can, <laughs> you can pop their box if you, if you uh, are running into any corporate Plan 9 networks. Um, <clears throat> so. After I dealt with Plan 9, I, I, and I don't want to turn this into a biography, but I, I do want to, to mention that um, a reasonable amount of time separated 
the, the creation of this vulnerability in plan, or the creation of this exploit for plan nine, and the research that I was doing in the Erlang virtual machine. And does everyone here know what Erlang is, or have, have you heard of Erlang? Okay, it's computer programming language. I think that's suffice to say. Um, interpreted, as I mentioned before. Uh, very, very large source code. I mean, it's been built up over years. Um, it's a real computer program, and I think that it's not crazy to imagine that it is within an order of magnitude of some other computer programs that you might want to you know, evaluate, like uh, whatever, Open Office or Adobe or Word or a web browser. Um, so the technique that I took with this one was to, you know, try a bunch of different things concolic execution engines, symbolic execution engines, um, dynamic taint analysis to try to figure out where in Erlang might be the greatest source of, of vulnerabilities. And um, in the end, I to find this bug, I used a tool called Klee, which I'm going to get into a little bit later. Uh, it's a tool produced by University of Stanford, I believe. Um, and a critical aspect of symbolic execution that I didn't get into in, in the, the previous description of Plan 9 because it was such a, a narrow view into the behavior of the JPEG parser within Plan 9. You need to, if you are evaluating a C program, for example, you need to prune out everything that is not conceivably exploitable or that you don't believe could be reasonably exploited um, by some intelligent human. I, 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 and, and the intuition for this is totally a result of writing software and breaking other people's software. And I, I don't know if there's anything that I could give you that could tell you, like, here's what you need to look for beyond the basics of, like, you know, if they're not doing any sized allocations uh, and it's just uh, arithmetic that doesn't control the behavior of any later allocations, then you can forget that, just as an example. Um, you need to hone in on what you think is really hairy code, extract that code out into some place where you can run a simple, um, a simple test input against that bug, just like you were if you were doing a fuzzer, right? Like you would want to create a test harness for some set of code that you were interested in. And it's the same with symbolic execution, except maybe a little bit more refined in what you want to be extracted. Um, so I took out a piece of the regular expression matching code. Um, the bug is actually in, yeah, uh, regu compiled regular expressions within Erlang. And I did just this. I took out a, a huge swath of it, um, used a, a piece of software called Niffy, which a uh, native, native function in, in Erlang is, is called NIF. Um, and you... <sighs> you replace all of the elements of it that are, um, you have immediate control over as a user. And replace here means very simply, let's see here. Um, sorry, I, I don't have it included in here, but CLI makes symbolic, that's a function name. CLI makes symbolic is a tool that indicates to CLI, I'm going to want you to treat this as if you had control over its, uh, its value. And that may not be true, and you can subject CLI to various assumptions about what kinds of values you can provide, if that's, if that's something that you need to, to do. But um, in the end, I think, as I, as I told you, uh, I, I found a, actually, I think I found the very first remotely exploitable vulnerability in Erlang. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. I, I, the first CVE for it, I, don't, I, I didn't register the CVE, and so I... I have, I have not taken a, a serious look into it. Um, and I also found some vulnerabilities in PCRE that were totally unrelated, as well as found some vulnerabilities that had already been fixed in PCRE that were, were fixed upstream. PCRE, by the way, is Perl compatible regular expressions. It's a widely used uh, regular expressions library. Uh, okay, so how do you, how do, you do this? Like, how, where, if you wanna get your feet wet, where do you get started? Uh, there's three tools that I would recommend to you, and, and once you start taking a look at these, uh, I think you will immediately branch out into all of the wide world of other things that, that um, 
abstract analysis of computer programs is concerned with. CNBC, CLE, Manticore. I haven't used Manticore nearly as much. Uh, it's something new by trail of bits or something like that. Uh, I, I, I can't, I don't include any information about it, but I have heard really great things about it. Um, CNBC and CLE I have used extensively though, and so I'm gonna try to show you guys what exploiting a basic like, you know, Aleph one, smash in the stack for fun and profit style vulnerability looks like inside of these two tools. Um, this is uh, a, a CBMC tool from Oxford. It's part of the C Prover set of tools. Um, primarily interested in program correctness and, and, and verification, but it does indeed have a lot of facilities for the conditions that I described earlier, which basically are writing outside of a region that you should be able to write outside of. Um, so if you, if you create a new C file with this simple, you know, overflow, um, whoops, obviously, you know, 16 byte buffer overflow, no unchecked string copy. Um, if you run CMBC on this alone, which is just, you know, dot slash CMBC, um, provide a trace, unwind, and pointer check, if you call this with, even without a, a, any kind of special indication that it should check this, it'll let you know, uh, hey, this is something that could be very bad. And this can be a little bit tricky in bigger programs because it looks at the translation unit of a C program when it is making these judgments about where the checking on variables is, and sometimes that's not the case. So sometimes there's actually, you know, just like we're calling overflow here, like overflow is safe if we check the length of the string prior to passing in um, the string argument. I'll, it means safe in quotes. It's theoretically okay. Um, however, the check for the safety of that property can occur anywhere in a computer program, but CNBC isn't necessarily going to be aware of that because it doesn't have high-level heuristics about that kind of thing. But um, the vast majority of vulnerabilities don't fit into that category. So you're, you're going to be great if you look at something that you suspect is some hairy C code. Um, it will quickly let you know with a whole lot less false positives than something like RATS or ITS4. I don't know what the current state of the art for like static analysis is or Sigital. I, I have never used it, but... I assume some people here have. Um, and it's very similar with Klee. Here's, here's Klee make symbolic. Um, with, Klee makes, with Klee, you're going to want to indicate, um, hey, I'm passing in a symbolic value, which is string, um, to overflow. And it, not only is this symbolic in the terms of the content, it's symbolic in terms of the length up to this value. And you can do that in two ways. You can indicate with, uh, with just like a loop. Like you can create a statically sized string and say for every value of this, um, you can just loop over it and say clean make symbolic of this particular value. Or clean make symbolic actually provides a facility for um, passing in an additional argument with var args for, hey, this is a unsized buffer, let me, let me know what, what uh, you think of it. And CLI, if you run it, um, CLI works a little bit differently. You have to compile the, the code that you're using with LLVM clang, rather. Uh, and then you run CLI on the result of this intermediate representation that's produced. Uh, and CLI gives you so much really valuable information, but if you're just trying to work with something that you believe has a stack-based buffer overflow, you're going to want to take a look at the error files. And error does not mean an error in CLI. It means error is detected by CLI. And so, you know, cat everything in, in your last CLI analysis. And you're going to see things like this, which this gets cut off a little bit here. But uh, what it says at the end is basically, oh, you know, what is a value for this? Well, if you provide string equals char of blah, 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 up to some ridiculously huge number, you're going to have a problem. And indeed, uh, that would cause a segmentation fault. Um, and 
you can also use Kali to test for heap overflows as well, but uh, there is within Kali a simple, a simple model of an allocator that I don't, to be frank, understand adequately to be able to describe to you what it's, um, w to what granularity it's, it's capable of understanding the behavior of blocks. Like, you know, you allocate a block, you allocate an adjacent block, you overwrite that adjacent block's heap chunk metadata. I don't think it has an enough understanding to know what is going to go on unless you provide the source code to an allocator whichever allocator your, your program has been compiled with, but that's going to make it a lot slower as well. Um, so what you're going to do with heap overflows is very similar to what you're doing with stack overflows, which is that you just look for a pointer into an area that you do not, you should not control. Um, what can give me that kind of, um, of a value for a pointer? And this is great. I mean, this... This works because CLI and CMBC and tools like this detect buffer overflows, and I suppose that a, a heap and a stack overflow are both part of this broader category of buffer overflows. But if you're doing something against uh, an allocator that relies on the behavior of the allocator to trigger the vulnerability, like in this piece of code here where realloc doesn't actually doesn't actually perform a check for the size of the newly allocated block, so it will take an existing block, uh, just have a free list that indicates, oh, I've just changed the size of this, update the associated heap chunk metadata, you allocate another block. Well, that block, if it's within the same arena, that is to say it's of the approximately the same size, uh, it will allocate it right next to it. And so now you have a memory leak of what was previously in there, you have the heap chunk metadata for what was previously in there. You can change the heap chunk metadata for what was previously in there. And then in the original block, you can, whatever, call free or something. on. I, I forget the exact details of whether you need to coalesce blocks or whether you need to free or what the, what the there's always a, a million different ways to exploit allocators. And it can get quite sophisticated. But in any case, it doesn't matter because uh, symbolic analysis wouldn't be able to tell you that this is the path you need to take. Um, so, you, you know, not to say that a fuzzer could either, but um, if you're hoping for some really high level understanding of computers and, you know, the organization of a C program, you're not going to get it. Um, you're getting a pretty low level um, by the books understanding of if this allocation occurs outside of the region it should, then uh, or excuse me, if this write occurs outside of the region it should, then that's bad, and if not, it's okay. Um, all right, yeah. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, I, I couldn't figure out a way to, to make this work with, a, with symbolic analysis. Um, and as I said, you, you often need this fine-grained model, and symbolic analysis just cannot provide that. Um, but symbolic analysis will and if you get into all of these tools, you know, you, you have a crash, for example. Just like I'm sure many of you have heard of the BitBlaze project. Um, CLI has a very similar facility just inside of um, the, the data that's generated by CLI. You saw in KTest last, or CLI last, you can run KTest on that and determine what happened to this variable prior to some crash. Uh, and I don't know if this is, I, I, didn't, I didn't hit my little timer here, so I don't know how much time I have left, but uh, I am open to questions. Nobody? All right. That's, that's it. Oh, what's up? You said MoFlo? I, I know I haven't. I haven't. I see. I see. No, I, uh, MoFlow, I, I, I have not. Uh, what, what's the story? I mean, uh, I see. I see. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, I, I, um, binary, I mean, it, it always struck me as a little bit tricky to do binary analysis um, symbolically. I mean, it's outside of the most clear cases like segmentation faults, um, 
it, it seems like a much trickier problem than be just being supplied C code. And uh, evidently, there's people that are working on it, though, and you know, BAP, and and of course, many other many other projects are trying to do like binary analysis. I think that's actually what BAP stands for. But uh, no, I, I haven't. That's great, Mofo. I'll, I'll take a look. Anyone else? All right. I, I hope you guys enjoy this talk, and I hope that you uh, you really dig Turcon 20. Take it easy, guys. <laughs> <laughs>